Friday, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, welcome to Medley's Partner Spotlight Series. We, we recently launched this Spotlight Series um, to highlight the work of some of our awesome partners. Um, and today we're really so honored to spotlight one of our partners here in New York, uh, Bronx Darks in Parkchester Medical. Um, so we're gonna have our clinical director of pharmacy services, Viral Shah, um, speaking with one of Bronx Docs in Parkchester's newest dermatology providers, Dr. Tejas Patel. Um, so in this webinar, we can learn more about Dr. Patel's practice and how he plans to expand dermatology access to the Medicaid population at Bronx Docs in Parkchester, um, and all about the services he's offering to the community and discuss any changes he's had to make given the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to write them right in the Q&A and we'll address them in the last five minutes of our discussion. But from there, uh, Viral, I'll hand it off to you if you can introduce yourself and we'll get right into it. All right, th thanks, Tony. Um, and thank you for coordinating and putting this together. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, thank you for being part of our uh, Partner Spotlight Series. My name is Viral Shah. I'm a clinical pharmacist by trade and I manage our clinical programs um, at Medley Pharmacy. As you know, Medley is a digital first food service specialty pharmacy where our goal is to provide affordable and accessible care to everyone. Our clinical programs are designed by keeping patients at the center of our care model. And we're grateful to have partners like Bronx Docs and Parkchester Medical help us along the way. Um, as we know, Bronx Docs is an award-winning multi-specialty healthcare practice serving the Bronx community. Uh, they deliver high quality community-based medical care, and uh, which is patient-centered, compassionate, and quality relevant. Having said all of that, um, you know, I'm very excited to have this conversation with Dr. Patel. Um, so Dr. Tejas Patel, why don't you start us off by telling a um, little bit about yourself, your background, where you go to school, and uh, where are you up to today? Uh, so, okay, so <laughs> hi, my name is Tejas so I, I, uh, I actually grew up outside of Chicago and I, I went to uh, undergrad for physics in the city, um, or sorry, for medical school and intern year. And then when it came time to do my residency, I decided when I decided I wanted to do dermatology, uh, I had, you know, rotated in a couple programs and decided to do my training at University of Miami uh, because it has a very um, high uh, transient population. So there's a lot of people with skin of color. Uh, learning a lot, a lot about those diseases at programs actually, in some senses, is, is difficult. So Miami had a very diverse population to learn from. A lot of skin cancers, so learning surgical techniques was pretty easy. Um, and then I think everyone knows the culture of Miami. Uh, the cosmetics population, uh, you know, is 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 pretty uh, avid there as well. So all around, it was a good training program, and I'm I'm glad I got to go there. Uh, and yeah, it was just a great experience. After that, I decided to come to New York and now I'm here for the foreseeable future. That, that's awesome. Um, so when, when did you join Bronx Docs um, and Parkchester Medical? So I started here, it's, it's probably coming up about a year now uh, that I started. Um, when I, so my, my original practice, practice is based in Brooklyn. And uh, when I first spoke with Neil, who leads Bronx Docs, uh, he told me about his vision for how he wanted um, to uh, give great care in an underserved community, and I think a lot of a lot of us in medicine, you know, can can agree with that kind of mission statement. Uh, I think the care here has been so fragmented for so long that having a one-stop shop where patients can get good quality care uh, quickly. Um, I think one of Bronx Docs' mottos is being able to see a primary care physician within 24 hours and a specialist within a week uh, really helps patients feel more comfortable and, and feel like they have a medical home. Uh, and so that's, you know, I, I think a great thing and I definitely wanted to be a part of it. So uh, I started about a year ago. I, I've, I feel very welcomed here and, and um, you know, the patient population has been great. So I'm really happy to be here. That's, that's awesome. I mean, that's what we're trying to do at Medley as well, affordable and accessible care for everyone. Um, and, you know, we're grateful to have partners uh, like Bronx Talks. And uh, so um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about how your practice has changed since last year, since COVID? Um, you know, everyone had to make an adjustment, um, but, you know, we're very, um, we'd like to hear more from you. What have you done, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, how are you making your patients uh, feel safer when they come visit you. Um, just 
give us more information on that. Sure. Uh, so, you know, obviously uh, COVID has kind of <laughs> upended everybody's life. Uh, I don't think there's any part of um, the world that is untouched from this. Um, you know, in medicine in general, I think the, the general things that everyone is doing, we're, we're also doing here to care for our patients. Temperature checks, questionnaires, asking them if they've been sick or been around sick, sick contacts and things like that. Uh, mask wearing is absolutely mandatory. Um, you know, there are patients that do try to come in and, and uh, try to skirt those rules. And we do tell them very respectfully that that's not something that, uh, that we support. So uh, for, for the most part, though, patients have been pretty good about making sure that they, they wear their mask and, and try to keep everyone else safe. Um, we have staggered, uh, you know, patient visits and, and spread them out a little bit. So we're just not seeing as, as much volume as, as we normally would. Um, so that has helped kind of ease the burden, both in the waiting area and, and in the back of the house where I'm seeing patients. Um, and, you know, when they're in the exam room with me, like I said, wearing masks, uh, standard safety precautions. Um, in dermatology, it's, it's been a little bit challenging because basically all of my job is, is, is on examination, right? That it, there are very few times where we look at labs um, and tests and things like that to, to do the work. We really just examine the person's skin based on inflammatory patterns and, and the, the, uh, how the rash looks is kind of how we make our diagnosis. And a lot of times, especially when someone comes in for stuff on their face, it's, it's a little bit difficult to get around the fact uh, you know, that the mask is there. Um, but for the most part, we've, we've found ways to deal with that as well. They can, you know, kind of hold their breath and just move their mask and either we take a picture or I just take a quick look and that, that gives me enough idea as to, uh, how to deal with the problem. But, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely made things more challenging on the, on the medical front, on the cosmetic front, I'll be honest, it's, it's both, uh, there, there's actually a couple differences. Uh, some people, um, in terms of, uh, they, they see themselves on Zoom calls like, like the one we're on now, and they, they look at themselves on the call and they get self-conscious and they're like, oh, I didn't notice this about myself before and now I see it every day when I'm on the Zoom call. And so we've actually had some, a lot more patients come in, you know, just mentioning that. Uh, on, on the flip side, there are other patients that we used to see more regularly that had client-facing jobs, PR and things of this nature that just aren't out anymore. Um, and so because they don't have the same social life and because they just don't have even the same professional life, uh, they, they don't feel like they need to, to do the cosmetic stuff anymore. And so that's been an interesting kind of dynamic between the two. Uh, and then just a lot of the work that dermatologists tend to do is on the face, like I said. So it's, it's, it's been a little difficult to working around masks and whatnot. Um, when our staff is in the room with the patient, uh, we do wear N95 masks if we're going to do a procedure that's going to be long on the face because obviously then the patient can't be wearing a mask. Um, but outside of that, that's kind of how, how we've dealt with it, both on the medical and cosmetic side. Th th that's actually very interesting. Um, uh, and just to add to that, um, are there like any specific skin conditions where you are okay with like just seeing patients virtually as opposed to having them visit you in person? Um, can, you, can you like elaborate on that as well? Yeah, so, so the great thing about dermatology is, like I said, it's a completely visual field for the most part. Um, and so if there's any one field in medicine that is great for telemedicine, it's, it's dermatology. Um, so right at the cusp of when the pandemic broke out late March last year, and everyone switched to telemedicine in April, May, and June uh, fully, 100% of the time, uh, dermatology was probably one of the easiest things to transition pretty seamlessly. Um, you know, it, it was pretty easy for me to follow up on patients, give them care, send their medications to the pharmacy, kind of tell whether or not they were doing better just based on what I was seeing. Uh, you know, I, I that technology has gotten as good as it came up. That great of a replacement of someone coming in to see me. Um, but, you know, it is, it is something that, that helped. Uh, and I, I think the big thing, both on the uh, payer side, the provider side, and, and on the patient side, is that, you know, prior to the pandemic, nothing really pushed anyone to adopt telemedicine or become comfortable with it. Um, and now, because of this thing that's going on, we, we all kind of were th thrust in at the same time and, and, and figured it out. And I think in dermatology, especially, it's gone very well. Uh, there, there are just so many um, technology platforms that, that help, um, you know, keep that connection, help us 
you know, take appropriate notes and all those things. And, and it's, it's just been, it's been a really easy transition in my field. So would you say that going forward, this will become like the normal standard of practice that patient may come in to see you in person, but they'll do follow up via video call. Um, just, you know, if, if it's very visual, you know, you can just look at them and be like, okay, this medication is working for you. This is not working for you. Um, it, do you think that's going to be the standard of practice going forward? So I will say, I think it's going to be a much more common part of the practice than we previously would have predicted prior to COVID. Uh, on, on the, you know, in, in dermatology, there are really three key areas, the medical dermatology, so acne, skin uh, rashes, things like that. Surgical dermatology, which is uh, either can be cosmetic or usually more um, skin cancers, cutting out skin cancers and things like that. And then the cosmetic. So the last two fields, the surgical and cosmetic, are, are obviously a little bit more difficult, if not completely impossible to do by telemedicine visits. You can basically only really do a consultation or I have this blemish that I don't like. You might be able to talk to them, but after that you have to do a procedure and for that they'd have to come into the office. So those two parts of the field will still be done in person because there's just no replacement for that right now. Um, on the medical side of things, I. I think it will become more common for people to see, especially follow-ups uh, with the drug comfortable for both the patient or waiting areas aren't filled up or our exam rooms aren't filled up with people that I can just check real quick and be like, oh, okay, your acne's gotten 80% better, but hey, I'm going to send this wash that'll make it 100% better. Uh, and, and that type of dynamic, just quick follow-ups and, and being able to see the problem and, and adjust to it uh, does make it does make me think that we're going to be doing a lot more telemedicine, um, not completely, but as I said, but a lot more than we had in the past. Yeah, um, that, that makes total sense. Um, uh, one of the very common questions that we get at a pharmacy level is that, um, you know, it's specific to like acne. People will come in and they're like, hey, when do, do you think we should like use topical acne creams or as opposed to like going to the doctor um, and, you know, getting like an antibiotic for the treatment? Um, how should we like respond to that as a pharmacist? I mean, uh, you know, we, we don't diagnose, but we, we give them like recommendations on what they can use over the counter, but it's very hard to tell someone that, hey, you know, why don't you just go see a doctor and uh, maybe, right. you know, yeah. So, so I would say they're, whether they, they, um, they're the physician or, or adjunct, uh, has a different line. And probably I would say to me, the most objective line is usually scarring, right? So if the patient's scarring, you know, the, the thinking there is scarring, it, you know, it requires lasers or needling, things like that to get rid of. So really the whole reason we treat acne is to make sure the patient doesn't continue to scar. And so I would usually tell people both in primary care and, and uh, you know, our, our partners in, in pharmacy that if you see a patient has scarring acne, then it's probably best for them to see a dermatologist sooner rather than later. Mainly because if you put them on, on washes and creams and things over the counter that just don't work, they'll continue to, to get, gather more and more scars in that time frame when they could have just been seen and tr been treated and, and been intervened on appropriately so that way they don't get that scarring. Um, when it's non-scarring acne, like blackheads, whiteheads, and things of that nature, a lot of the over-counter stuff does work. Um, and you know, it just requires educating the patient for like about five or 10 minutes and making sure they're using things appropriately. A lot of times I find, let's take different gel, which just went uh, uh, over the counter recently. Uh, um, you know, a lot of patients, a lot of patients I find they'll say, oh, I, I, have this acne here and I, I put it there. Uh, different is it preventatively in the entire area of acne. So really what the patient needs to do when they're using different is, is to apply it to one general area. And a lot of times it's just telling the patient like, hey, make sure you use it all over your face or let's say they just get acne on their cheeks and use it all over your cheek instead of to each spot um, because it's preventative. And, and just clarifications like that can save them a trip, trip to the doctor. No, that's that's uh, great information. Um, how do you 
how do you see uh, the field of dermatology changing going forward? Um, I know, I know there is more awareness now, so people are, um, you know, like going to the doctors, you know, for their skin conditions. And something that very interesting that you mentioned earlier is that people are on Zoom calls all the time, and now they're noticing like their face more, and you know, and all of a sudden they're like, "Well, I need to go see a doctor." Um, but um, at yeah. what point, like, you know? If they notice something, should it go to the doctor right away? Or like, what, you know, what are the best practices when it comes to like taking care of your skin? So, okay. So first thing, I mean, every dermatologist's primary job is yeah. to make sure we're treating skin cancer, right? Because out of everything we do, uh, that's the most serious, especially melanoma. Um, so probably the, the first thing that I'd say for anyone that asks me about skincare is, wear sunscreen, right? So sunscreen can both prevent skin cancer, uh, especially melanoma. And a, a lot of people don't know this, but it can also actually help prevent wrinkles. Uh, UV radiation basically just shreds your elastin and collagen fibers that are in your dermis. And so over the course of time, um, that's why people look very old and wrinkly, right? So if you, if you see the, the, you know, and I'm not naming anyone in particular here, but if you see the women in Florida that look like leather handbags, the reason they look that way is because they haven't worn enough sunscreen over the course of their life in Florida, right? So if you want to avoid that look, the best thing to do is wear a very high SPF sunscreen, um, broadband UVA, UVB coverage, uh, water resistant if you're going to be swimming in the ocean and things like that, um, and, and mineral-based sunscreens like titanium and, and uh, zinc-containing ones are always the best ones to use. Uh, so that's probably the first thing I'd say about skincare um, is just, you know, cancer prevention. Uh, the, the second thing, I, I think, uh, unless you're living under a rock, everyone's seen how big skincare has become in the last 10 years. Even when I chose to do dermatology as my residency, I don't think I nor anyone in my field predicted that it would be as big as it's become today. Um, all over the news, celebrities are pushing products and starting companies and things of this nature. Uh, you know, a lot of people are a lot more conscious about just the, the face they put forward basically on a day to day basis. Um, you know, I, I would probably say to get the best bang for your buck, it is worth a consultation with a dermatologist just to know like, okay, this is the skin tone I have. These are the things I should be focused on. These are my goals. And based on those goals, these are the products that, um, you know, will work for what I want to do. A lot of times I tend to get patients who have already been on a skincare regimen for two or three years and they're like, well, I use this toner and it has this ingredient and whatnot. And it's all fine and good that they've kind of read up on it. But to be honest, a lot of times, a lot of the things are contradictory. They don't work together well, or they're not using the right thing for what they want. You know, they'll say, okay, I have these dark spots and they're using something that may even make their skin darker just because they, they didn't have anyone directing them, right? It's just marketing. Uh, that's telling them that, hey, you should use this or that. And so getting that initial consultation with a skincare provider, and, and you know, you could just tell them, like a lot of my patients either bring the bottles that they're using with them or just take pictures. And they just say, hey, these are the things that I'm using. What do you think? What do you like? Um, and, you know, for, for people on my side of the, the fence, uh, we're usually having to keep up with every new product that's coming out. Uh, I know me and my fiance, uh, we have to try out new creams and washes all the time because we never know when a patient's going to come in and ask us like, hey, what do you think of the ordinary's new serum or something, right? Um, and so I think a lot of patients tend to think as dermatologists, oh, I have poison ivy, I'll go now. Uh, the breadth of the field is, is a lot wider. And, uh, and it would, it, it, instead of wasting two years on buying 15 different potions, just stop by the dermatologist, talk to them once, we can direct you to, to the correct thing. So that way you're, you're getting the most of your money. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and lastly, uh, any of our audiences or uh, if anyone needs to get in touch with you, how, you know, how should they contact you? Wait, are you, I'm sorry, was that a question for me? Or? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, should I just go through your practice? Um, you know, um, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'll be at Bronx Docs um, here and, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to be building out the dermatology service. I'll definitely be here. Patients can obviously, we're, we're happy to welcome them. 
Uh, the practice is still growing, so we definitely have uh, room for people to come in. Um, and then I have two offices in Brooklyn, so I'm happy to see people there as well. Um, yeah, I, I think the best way, the first time especially, um, the first time especially, I think the best thing to do is, is to come see me, so that way I can at least put a name to a face. And then I, most of my patients, I actually give them my email address. So a lot of times, instead of them having to call and be put on hold and maybe the message doesn't get to me, I respond to my patients by email all the time. So I'm, I'm usually always accessible. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to- No hope. problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. Much to tell, Bureau. That was great. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that we were able to connect. Um, I, we have a, one question that from the audience um, for Dr. Patel. So Dr. Patel, what percentage of your practice is cosmetic versus medical? And how does insurance coverage impact that? So uh, the cosmetic part of our practice um, at Bronx Docs right now, we're still building out the cosmetic uh, service. So it's, it's probably, I would say, 10 to 20 percent now here, 80 um, percent uh, medical. At my office, it's probably more like a 60-40 split. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to, um, let's say, like you said, you're juxtaposing both cosmetic and, and medical. Mm -hmm. A lot of patients don't realize that a lot of the things that they think should be cosmetic end up being. Uh, sorry about that. So a lot of the patients don't realize like a lot of the things end up being covered by uh, medical visits. And so, you know, getting that initial assessment is, is the best way to tell. Um, conversely, a lot of patients do come in thinking everything is covered by their insurance company when a lot of things aren't, unfortunately. And so there's really just no substitute for coming in and just talking and addressing your concern usually for the most part, at least the first time, the visit itself and the consultation can, can be covered by insurance. Unless, let's say, Tony, for the sake of argument, you're like, hey, like I know that I want Botox and that's the only thing you're coming in for. And then at that point, even the visit's not covered. But for the most part, for those for the most part, for those patients, we usually do the consultation, um, you know, but uh, just on the house. And then we kind of walk them through the options based on what they're looking for. Gotcha. Okay. No, very interesting. And, and I'll say you hit the nail on the head when you said patients are, are checking themselves out in Zoom calls and, and getting a little stressed out. I feel like we're, we've all been there. Um, but I think we're at time. Right. And this, is, this has been awesome. So really, really grateful that um, we were able to have this conversation and um, spotlight both Bronx Docs and Parkchester Medical and Dr. Patel. So thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you on our next spotlight series. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Beryl. Have a good one.